Hello everybody and welcome to the Postcon Asia 2021 and I'm going to start the presentation in the big data track titled Cassandra Powered Workflows to Automate at Scale. My name is Maciej Świderski and I'm independent software engineer consultant, a big workflow enthusiast in the field for more than 15 years. Uh, I'm as well a creator of the Automatica project that I'm going to use today for demonstration and occasionally write blogs to share knowledge and tweets about workflows and software development. So let's get started with the content of this presentation by looking quickly at the workflows themselves. So workflows uh, look at the business logic from an end to end uh, perspective rather than individual fragments. Uh, workflows in many forms are commonly used to define business needs when building applications or services. There are different formats that uh, workflows can be expressed in, uh, and the most common ones are the graphical ones like uh, BPMN, that stands for Business Process Model Implementation, and that is sort of a flowchart representation of the uh, workflow, or you can use the declarative approach, which is more of um, a format that is uh, promoted by uh, like the step functions or servers, uh, serverless workflow specification, or even Jenkins file or GitHub actions that are an examples of uh, workflows that are declarative. Among many benefits, workflows aim at bringing, first of all, the visibility to the defined business logic. And it's not just for having business logic defined for the business and IT alignment, but it's more for the folks uh, that are actually working with the business uh, requirements and with the service or application on a daily basis. So it's to better understand uh, the logic behind it and to be able to easily grasp uh, different or any anomalies or even needs for a change, because we know that uh, we won't be able to proceed uh, and have a perfect software from the beginning, the, the changes are coming anyway. Another aspect is the isolation that comes out of the box with workflow solutions. By isolation, I mean that uh, having complete control over the data uh, that a given uh, instance is working with, uh, because looking at the workflow themselves, uh, a workflow is a uh, it can be divided in like two parts. One is the definition, which is considered kind of a blueprint uh, of the business logic. But then at invocation at runtime, we have each uh, logic represented as individual uh, instances. So with the, uh, with the instances having uh, their own life cycle, including uh, the data management, the actors involved in that instance, and the current state that uh, the instance is currently in. So that is all managed uh, by the workflow solutions. Uh, next, we have the domain data contract, and this is where we actually can help properly scoping the data that is managed by the uh, workflows. And this is where we can simply classify data as input or output, internal, sensitive, and so on and so forth. This is all modeled inside our workflow definition, so we can have a proper and easy understanding of what uh, the workflow data is working with, and by that, uh, expose a contract uh, by the workflow definition. Last but not least is the integration with outside world. Workflows uh, will need to communicate with other systems because they are not like isolated islands. Uh, so either explicitly uh, by invoking different services or by uh, sending out events, we need to have an easy way to get those integration into the workflow uh, solutions as well. So this is one of the key factors when looking at the workflow solutions. So looking at the workflows themselves, we can uh, expose them in a different way. So one of the most traditional one is the service, uh, workflow as a service. Uh, that brings an idea of modeling the service, but exposing that as a, a fully featured service with dedicated and domain specific APIs. Workflow as a service aims to cover more traditional service deployments that are usually uh, consists of a service API exposed over like a web interface like HTTP or REST, uh, an open API definition that describes the service uh, to make sure that uh, the consumers of the service can easily understand what is behind it and what can uh, do for them. Taking advantage of the various integration uh, mechanisms to be able to exchange data with external systems uh, and the ability to be either short-lived or long-lived because uh, Workflows can have different life cycles as well. So workflow as a service does not really differ from like any other development developed service. 
The main advantage it provides is the ability to use the well-established and known uh, languages such as BPMN that are uh, put in the context of programming languages. Other features are for the most part very similar to those that could be coded by hand. Uh, next uh, way of exposing the workflow is a workflow as a function. And the workflow as a function is dedicated for short-lived uh, solutions uh, that usually last no longer than seconds or maybe up to a minute or so. They are expected to be fast and small in size uh, but at runtime, uh, both at runtime and boot time. Workflow as a function uh, typically targets deployment in, in more constrained uh, environments, such as uh, AWS Lambda, or Google Cloud Run, or Azure Functions. Uh, however, it's not strictly limited to them, uh, as they can easily be invoked over HTTP in both uh, post and get uh, endpoints, making them pretty much uh, deployable anywhere. But uh, regardless of the number of activities it, it contains, the workflow as a function flow will always be considered as a single entry point and expected to run from the beginning till the end. Uh, and further, going further, we have the workflow as a function flow. Uh, workflow as a function flow is more advanced uh, extensions to workflow as a function, which breaks the workflow into many different functions. A function in the in, in workflow terms is a single uh, executing activity, and the single uh, executing activity can be uh, considered those that are actually modifying the state of the uh, instance, and by state it's both moving between the, the different activities and modifying or alter, altering the data model that is uh, managed by the workflow instance. So in the diagram presented here, we can see that it's pretty much the same uh, workflow as we seen for the workflow as a service and workflow as a function. But here we can see that uh, all the pieces that are actually grouped as functions. So as mentioned before, uh, the only those activities that perform the change of the workflow state are considered functions. But there are different types of activities that are part of the workflow definition, such as start events or the gateway that is uh, that, that control the the logic uh, or sort, sort, are sort of uh, decision point. And those are combined into the function that is being executed. So in this particular example, we have four functions that uh, goes over the entire workflow. And the logic uh, behind the workflow of the function flow is that it's the workflow definition that steers the way uh, which activities are being invoked as functions. But the interesting part of the workflow as a function flow is that all those functions are invoked by events. And by that, they can be invoked pretty much at any time and scale individually to pretty much no limit as well. Uh, so knowing a bit of a theory behind the workflows themselves and how they can be exposed to the outside world, let's look at the more fast and more uh, towards the data storage uh, uh, data. Stateful and stateless are actually those uh, factors that decide what the workflow instance would do. And here we have the options to either persist the data or we simply ignore the persistence layer and move on and keep only the in-memory state. So this all can be classified based on the certain principles. So for instance, for the stateful, we have the long running from minutes to years because long running uh, workflows can be really depending on the human actors involved or activities that perform automatic updates based on the system data availability and so on and so forth. So it requires data storage to persist both state and the complete data set that the instance is working with. And those usually apply to workflow as a service and workflow as a function flow. On the other side, the stateless, it's usually targeting the short-lived uh, uh, instances that are meant to f finish within seconds uh, and up to minutes, but uh, usually those are uh, finalized in seconds. There is no need for data storage and there is usually a bit limited of capabilities that for instance, when it comes to retries, there are in-memory tries, we cannot uh, delegate that to different workers and so on and so forth. And this uh, stateless approach usually applies to workflow as a function or workflow as a function flow if we go for more of orchestration kind of workflows. So having that explained, let's look at what actually means stateful and by knowing that it requires a data store. So here we uh, 
dive into the use of the data stores and in particular example this uh, presentation is about Apache Cassandra. So I would like to put a bit of uh, emphasis that what it means to store, to store data from the workload point of view. So first of all, uh, Apache Cassandra that is highly distributed and fault tolerant data store. The main uh, characteristic of Apache Cassandra are excellent summary that the workflows, the workflow solutions are all about to be able to access instances at any time and pretty much anywhere. It's one of the most commonly heard requirements about workflow solutions because there are a lot of actors and a lot of systems in a distributed environment that needs to interact and needs to be conducted by both the actors uh, working with uh, workloads and the workload instances themselves. In today's world, uh, where everything becomes more and more distributed, the possibility to operate in a global scale is a massive. Both systems and actors are located around the globe and thus the expectations are that this can be accessed the data can be accessed in pretty much anywhere and in a very fast manner. Patrick Cassandra delivers this exact thing. Data are replicated around the ring that can span across geographically distributed data centers with advanced replication mechanism partitioning data can be accessed from anywhere efficiently. Workflows are usually a natural fit as the data they represent is uniquely identified and this can be properly modeled with Cassandra key spaces uh, for different and uh, for efficient access. So knowing that Cassandra is a very good fit for a uh, story for the workflows to make sure that we can run at scale and we can make sure that the data is accessible pretty much anywhere. Let's look at what it actually needs to be stored. So with the workflow instance state is the actual information about where the workflow instance is meaning what activities are currently in the wait state, because this is what kind of drives the instances uh, lifetime. Uh, workload instances can go into wait state, meaning that they, they, ask, uh, they ask or they wait for a particular uh, external triggers. And those triggers can be either human actor completing a task, or there might be a system calling it uh, explicitly or receiving a message, or even a time-based uh, operation such as waiting for a timer to expire. The workflow instance data on the other side is the heart of the workflow execution because in the end the workflows are all about uh, altering the data, meaning from the inputs going through the number of activities and processing an output. So the data at any single point in time where the instance is persisted needs to be persisted with it. Optionally, uh, as the, this is one of the advantages of using uh, Cassandra and its uh, query-based design, we can actually denormalize the data of the workflow to efficiently enable uh, queries on top of it based on the workflow patterns within our system or within our application. So this is what we can actually achieve very efficiently uh, building up on top of Apache Cassandra. So knowing what is going to be stored, let's look at how things are going to be stored. So here the workflow instance state is stored in a table that is first of all dedicated to a given workflow definition a workflow definition is identified by uh, uh, ID of it and the version. So if we have multiple versions of the same definition, all instances of given definition with the version are stored independently. Uh, it, the, the, the table itself gives the minimal set of information in a very compact format. So it is expected that it will be small, but efficient enough to provide a way of restoring the instance at any point in time and continuing with the workflow definition defined logic. At the same time, the, the same table contains the complete data set as in a binary format and expressed in a Cassandra as a blob. So that is uh, meant to easily capture all the data that we have and at the same time allow to have a secure uh, storage because both the data are not clearly visible in a clear text as uh, they are stored in, the, in, in, in Cassandra but it, can, it, it, it enables us to attach on top of it like an encryption mechanism on top of the, the bytes data that we or the binary data that we're going to store. On top of that, uh, each table that is uh, dedicated to the workload definition has a secondary index and that is mainly to enable uh, a correlation based lookups and because the correlation is the 
taking a, uh, taking into account not just the identifier, which is a primary key of the, of each instance, but it allows us to use a set of uh, tags uh, that can give uh, additional information on top of the running instance. So as you can see, the, a single uh, workload definition will have a dedicated table. All the instances belonging to that definition will be stored in that table. So what we can get out of the box, and this is where we go into the Automatica project. Uh, so uh, me as a creator of the project, I would like to introduce you a bit because I'm going to use that for demonstration. So the Automatica project is an open source workflow toolkit to build business focused uh, services and functions based on the workflow definitions. So Automatica comes with support for Apache Cassandra as the uh, data store, and that will uh, pretty much do everything for you. Uh, that is required to persist data efficiently in the, uh, in the Apache Cassandra. So it means that it will create a table for each worker definition that you have in your service. It will as well create a secondary index for each worker definitions and create a table uh, for keeping track of time-based operations. So, so known as well as the timers, because you can have like a delays in your workload definition that you want to pause the workflow execution for a certain amount of time. So this is where the, this uh, goes uh, out of the box as well. And you have the options to use the timers efficiently within your Apache Cassandra cluster too. So I think that gives us a kind of a ground for from the theoretical point of view. So let's look at uh, sort of a demonstration and a use case that I wanted to bring up today. And this is based on the support incidents use case. Uh, so where we have the options to uh, allow users around the globe to actually interact with the systems, report incidents, and those incidents are properly, properly routed to support teams that handle those incidents. And we have the clear co cooperation between the uh, the actors of the case. So first of all, a uh, bit of requirements uh, around this uh, use case. So we have the users that can report incidents uh, pretty much from anywhere. Support teams are as well geographically distributed to, pro to provide 24 seven response time. And support teams monitor incoming support cases to be able to classify them based on the severity assigned to the proper uh, groups to handle the incidents, uh, request additional information if there is a need for, uh, marks incidents according to their status. Make sure that we don't have too long uh, running uh, cases that are still open or not resolved and so on and so forth. And at the same time, both incidents reported and support teams can make comments at any time during incidents can be. So this, those are like very simplified uh, requirements for uh, an artificial uh, support incidents use case, but uh, should serve as well for describing the, the usage of the workflows and backed by the storage with the Apache Cassandra. So those are pretty much the uh, principles that we have seen or more and more uh, these days that we have both the users that are distributed around the globe or the data are distributed around the globe. And we need to kind of follow uh, the sun uh, approach to make sure that the data are always available. The, uh, there are support uh, teams behind the, uh, behind the system as well 24 seven and around the globe. So to make sure that we can actually achieve that, we can model this uh, use case as a workflow. So here in this particular example, I have it modeled in the BBMN uh, format. And by that, we can easily get this uh, going. So we have the incidents uh, classification, we have the support team handling, and we have the uh, notify report as well. At the same time, when that preliminary task are performed, we have the information that waits for the case to be resolved and that is based on the status of, uh, of the case. It can be manually closed whenever needed. And at the same time, we have the, uh, to, on top of the main path, uh, we have two alternatives path that can be invoked at any time. So that is to add the comment and based on the uh, given comment, we can actually verify if the status should be changed. For instance, we can simply use like a, a keyword that will allow us to close the case or resolve the case. And then if someone mentions uh, the other ones, so for instance, we can easily use the add reporter or add support, uh, and those are will be immediately causing notifications to the mentioned uh, groups. Uh, last but not least, we have the options to work on the reassignment between the support teams, because uh, in many cases it might be uh, firstly uh, wrongly assigned, so it might need to be reassigned. 
But at the same time, as mentioned at the very beginning, Workhorse allows us to work with the uh, data model and be able to create a database contract. So here we have information about what data we are going to work with. So we have the incidents, we have the comments, we have the status, assigning, which is our support group, and then incident key, which is uh, generated based on each incoming uh, incident. So from the storage point of view, we actually have the uh, option what is generated. So as mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, the automatic project and storage with Cassandra will create a dedicated table for uh, for uh, each work of definition. And in our case, the incidents table is actually dedicated table for storing workload instances of the work of definition identified as incidents. In addition to that, uh, the use of Apache Cassandra allows us to employ the query uh, design principle. And we have here the options to create additional tables. And here we have a table that is actually targeting the reporter. So we have the incident by reporter, so we can easily find things by a reporter identifier, like an email address. Or we can have the incident by support team, so we can have kind of a, a build up an inbox uh, for the support team, so they can easily see what's in their queue. And again, this is all taken care of uh, by the uh, by the workflow solution. So we have less and less of needs for doing the coding. So I think it's enough of the presentation. So let's jump back to the to quickly look at the uh, model itself. So here we have our project, and this is all based on the automatic. As I mentioned, that I'm going to use that for the uh, presentation. So here is our workflow definition in BPM and format. So it's, it's pretty much the same thing as it was uh, shown in the presentation. On top of that, we have a bit of code as well. So it's our data model. For instance, if we look at the incident, so it's a, like a data uh, transfer object. So we have some information about the incident itself and what is it going to uh, contain. So a bunch of models, data model objects. We have the support incident index. So this is what is actually responsible for building up this additional two tables, like the incident by support key and incident by reporter. So this is where we actually interact directly with uh, Apache Cassandra. But there is no much uh, need of knowing what uh, to instantiate. You will be, uh, the, the, this class will be invoked automatically by the workflow engine whenever there is a need to. So for instance, whenever the, there is a data event published about the workflow instance so we can get, drop the information out of it and work with the uh, populating the proper uh, tables according to the needs. And lastly, we have a bunch of services uh, that are actually invoked from within the uh, data model, uh, from within the workflow definition. So we have the classification service, assignment service, so we can easily automatically assigned to the first line support group uh, for each, or we can, for instance, look at the incident service. This is where we actually classify the incident. The interesting thing, because I'm going to show that here, is that if we don't have uh, the company specify, it will have a low priority, but we have as well the priority as companies and it's called Apache here. So we're going to look at different uh, aspects of the presentation uh, when creating different incidents with different data that will drive us in, in towards the different uh, classification. So this is pretty much a quick run through the uh, code base that is required for the service to run. So let's now get to one theory and just run business a build that will just create um, a container image. So we quickly uh, deploy uh, as, as a container to make sure that it can, can, can nicely communicate with the outside port. But before we deploy that, let's look at our uh, Cassandra. So it's, uh, it's already connected to the cluster. So we can use the automatic no, uh, space. And we can see this client tables to see what we have. First, there are no tables whatsoever, but uh, since we already built the container, we can just very quickly run it. And once the service is starting up, it will connect to Cassandra and it will create all the required tables. So it's up and running now. 
if we do the same here, as you can see, we have the incidence in 80 jobs. So incidence 1.0, this is our process, or this is our workflow, the definition, so this is ID and the person, and 80 jobs is the table that keeps the track of the uh, components working with uh, time timer jobs. So we can quickly look at the described incidence. Here, so here you can see there are a bunch of uh, columns. So we have the instance ID, which is our primary key. We have the content, which is the blob, as I mentioned. We have tags, that are the additional things that we can uh, keep track of. And we have the version tracking, which is going to make sure that we uh, don't override accidentally the data. And we have as well the uh, index on the tags, to make sure that we can do the correlation based lookup. All right, so we have our service up and running. So let's get started looking at how it looks like. So we, we just go here, we have the complete uh, description of the service. So we can see that we have a support case handling and those are the all the endpoints that the service are exposing. But this is all based on the workflow definition. You don't have to build anything of the web layer and of the REST API. This is automatically, automatically taken care of by the automatic approach. So we can actually start a new instance here. Let me just try it out. Let's put the description. Cannot log in to the HR system. We say it's company, let's say it's open and user smart check. Severity, let's put it high because I want it to be high and it's like, like it. as soon as I create this one, it creates a new instance of the workflow that will execute and perform a number of operations. The thing why it takes a bit more time here is that it was not capable of creating the uh, tables. Perfect. All right. And now we're back. So as you can see, we had a bit of a stop there because the tables were about to be created and those are the tables, those additional tables. So incident by support team and incident by reporter. Now we have them created. And if you look at it, assign us the support team, a uh, support uh, ID of the incident. So we can actually look very quickly at instance select all from team incident by reporter. So we can see that we have this one properly done with the title, with the number of comments. You can similar to the by support team. As you can see, even though I specify that it's supposed to be a severity high, it checked based on the classification rules that it was normal because it's the an enterprise company. So if we go back here and just slightly change the information that it is Apache, and let's put it that it's John who reports that, but still the same issue that we have the cannot log in. As you can see, we get the new ID of the case. And if you look at here, the same support team, now we have it NP severity set to, set to origin because it is based on the Apache with the privilege of prioritized company. So here we have all the information in the reporter, again, the same thing, but we have uh, additional column here that we can see the number of comments here. So with that, we can actually easily get, let's get the Argent one. So this is the one we should prioritize to work with. And we can easily work with the comments. So we can add comments here. So the only thing we do here is to specify our identifier there and we specify here. So we ask, is there any progress? And it's John who asked this. We can just add it there. All right. And if we go back here, look at the reporter, we already have one comment. The good thing is that on top of that, we can easily look at um, Right, so this allows us to quickly as well look at the data that we have in the visual format. 
So let's look at which one of it. So it was uh, 195 at the end. Five. So if we look here, we have both the, the same workflow definition, but it already shows us what is the active uh, tasks. So we can either complete it based on the status change or we can complete it manually. We know that the uh, comment was added. And we can see here as well all the information that the uh, incident case is uh, contained. So here, here we have our comments, we have the complete incident information and the status. We can very quickly close this one and add another comment. And uh, let's say it is a reply from the support team. That again, we can look very quickly here. That was the five. We can look at here. The comments are being appended. And at the same time, we can look at here. Not here, we can still. In addition to that, since we have the tailored uh, tables uh, based on the query design principle, so we can easily do the filtering based on the reporter. In that case, let's say, let's look at John only. So we can easily fill that out efficiently in front of work. Uh, lastly, I wanted to show you that, as mentioned in the comments, we can easily get, for instance, let's say that John is replying, that we can log in now, thanks, and that says, Close. So this is the use of the keywords by the close. If we just add that comment, we look here. The status is already closed, and if we look back here, we just look it up. It's only two incidents. The one nine five is already confirmed here. So this shows us that we can easily take advantage of interaction between workflows. The API is explored by them. And back find extremely efficient and highly distributed in full tunnel and uh, Apache Cadmanta storage. To the presentation, and let's go back and look at the conclusions here. So, the advantage of using Apache Cassandra is to allow us to replicate the work, for instance, pretty much to any level and with ease. The key space and the cluster settings are still under your control. So, this is extremely important because you can find in your uh, cluster and the key space the way you like or the way you need and by making sure that we can grab the data of the workflow which is stored in compact format we can denormalize it and only based on the requirements we have we can store them in um, additional tables so we can by that improve searchability and open up an application specific uh, ways of accessing data or supporting the workflows of your uh, application services. At the same time, due to the fact that the uh, workflow instances are always uniquely identified, it allows us to efficiently use the primary key and partition key uh, to make sure that the access to the instances to work on them is extremely efficient and allows us to group the information between uh, relevant or related uh, activities in the same partition. But it's not always that everything looks so good and uh, it's, uh, everything is perfect. There are certain pain points that I would like to point out here. So one of the most important parts is the Tompion, because Cassandra is very good at handling huge amounts of data, but the deletion that is, when it's frequent, it causes the problems that might impact performance. But on the other side, the workflow engines, the workflow solutions are optimized for running very well at when, whenever the instances are active but then trying to clean up as much as possible for instance when the work on instances are already completed so this is kind of a clash here and, and thing to, to keep in mind that the, the solution might be that we simply configure the, the work on the engine to not remove things uh, when the instances are completed but simply update the status so with that we don't have to care that much on, with the increasing number of functions and still have an extremely powerful uh, storage. 
The next thing that I would like to point out here is the secondary index uh, that is used for the correlation lookup, but it needs to be verified in the, in the real uh, load and the real amount of uh, data. Because this is what we need to verify if secondary index will be fast and good enough. Uh, because depending on the use cases, you might not use that frequently, the correlation lookups, and by that you won't be affected with the secondary index potentially being too slow. Uh, lastly, I would like to point out the size limit of the column value because we store the workflow state and data as block in the binary format. That might be that whenever the workflow instance is taking care of a lot of data, it might be a potential uh, issue on the storage as well. So those three points I think are extremely good to keep in mind and make sure that those are sort of known to us uh, that we don't have to spend too much time on troubleshooting later on. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude. And in case you would like to get uh, a bit more information, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter so either um, with my account or the automatic project. If you'd like to learn a bit more about the automatic, or then I would encourage you to link at the, our website. So the QR code will be taken directly to the website. And there you can find links to uh, examples, to documentation, and uh, more. And if you would like to explore that in a more uh, detailed fashion, please uh, reach out to me as well. I'll be more than happy to give another talk that you would look for me that. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for listening and open up for questions. Thank you very much.